Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things nuclear from a different perspective. My name is Libby Halevi. I am the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when those nuclear so called experts get it wrong. This week, a very special interview, one that I have been chasing for four years. It's with Dr. Timothy Mousseau. He is an evolutionary biologist who has been doing hands on research into species mutations at Chernobyl and Fukushima. This is one interview that you must hear. We'll also have an activist action minute with Erica Gray. Notice of one nuclear problem, along with a step that you, yes, you can take to do something about it right now. This week, tell the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to stop accepting nuclear waste from Germany. Plus, our ever popular Numbnuts of the Week feature, Nuclear Reactor Duck, and Cover Report, Activist Shout Outs, and more honest nuclear information than the EPA's Gina McCarthy offered up when grilled by Congress last week. She was being grilled on Flint, but she used the exact same techniques that she uses when she's denying all things nuclear. So, all this information is going to be coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, February 16, 2016, and here is the week's nuclear news from our perspective. The Indian Point nuclear power station is still leaking, and nobody seems to know where that leak is coming from. Last week, tritium in the groundwater was at 650 times higher than the amount that is allowed in drinking water. Now it's at 740 times, and there's no limit in sight. Entergy, which operates the facility at the edge of the Hudson River only 35 miles from midtown Manhattan, insists that there is no danger to humans from the spill, but you wouldn't expect them to say anything else. An Associated Press investigation published in 2011 found that three-quarters of the commercial nuclear power facilities in the United States had reported tritium leaks. Continuing on this theme, it's time for the nuclear reactor duck <coughs> and cover report. At Entergy's Riverbend Nuclear Station in St. Francisville, Louisiana, the NRC plans a special inspection after an unplanned reactor shutdown on January 9th and the following day, operational errors that led to a one-hour loss of shutdown cooling. <coughs> Entergy's Waterford 3 nuclear power facility in Kelowna, Louisiana, faces possible penalties from the NRC because contractors failed to conduct hourly firewatch inspections within the plant for eh, about 15 months. So why are those penalties only possible instead of mandatory? <coughs> And after problems at three nukes from Entergy, there are two from First Energy that are having problems. Both the reactor at Perry, Ohio, 30 miles northeast of Cleveland, and Beaver Valley Nuke in Hookstown, Pennsylvania, located 30 miles northwest of Pittsburgh, are shut down to repair persistent problems. <coughs> at the Pilgrim Nuclear Facility in Massachusetts, an Entergy... Do you catch a theme here? An energy security officer falsified 200 records for two years while on fire watch to compensate for, quote, inoperable fire suppression. The call is out to make energy pay a $28 million fine and then shut down Pilgrim to put us all out of our misery. <coughs> and in an unduck move, on Friday, February 12th, the Tennessee Valley Authority announced that they were abandoning plans to build two new Toshiba Westinghouse nuclear reactors at their Belfont site in Hollywood, Alabama. Congratulations to the Southern Alliance for Clean Energy, Blue Ridge Environmental Defense League, local chapter of the Belfont Efficiency and Sustainability Team, and Mothers Against Tennessee River Radiation, who are all legal interveners. And now... Nuclear Hot Seat Nuclear hot seed, nuclear hot seed, none that's out of week. What do Eddie the Trout, Ollie the Otter, Sammy Salmon, and Sherlock Shad all have in common? 
Each one of them is part of the page of logos, slogans, and mascots put together for your amusement and edification by the EPA. That's right, the Environmental Protection Agency, the group that can't get its head straight about North St. Louis or Flint or so many other places. Leave it to the EPA to be punting their responsibilities while offering the catchy logos be the solution to non-point source pollution meaning water and air pollution from diffuse sources. Be the solution to water pollution. Clean water starts with you. Clean water, it's everybody's business. And the health of America's waterways begins in your backyard. Unless your backyard happens to be adjacent to Coldwater Creek in North St. Louis, in which case it's not your fault. Given the feeble track record of the EPA and its titular head, Gina never met a nuke I didn't like in cover for McCarthy, it seems the agency cannot do its job and can't even come up with better than lame slogans, infantile mascots, and useless logos. Our tax dollars at work. And that's just one reason why the Environmental Protection Agency and all of its lame-brained little mascots are this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none that sound a week. Be sure to check out the website where we have the Missing Link section. Four articles, one each from Harvey Wasserman, Cindy Folkers, Byron DeLear interviewing Dr. Helen Caldicott, and a Kodak moment with a nuclear angle. Over to Japan, where 16 more children have been confirmed to have thyroid cancer in a second Fukushima survey. The survey began in April of 2014 to check the impact of the Fukushima nuclear disaster. When the results of the first and the ongoing second round of health surveys are combined, out of 300,000 children who were under 18 years of age when the disaster happened in 2011, 116 have confirmed cases of thyroid cancer and 50 are suspected of having it. Statistically, in a population of that size, there should be only eight cases. First, TEPCO announces that it has all equipment in place to build its underwater ice wall at Fukushima Daiichi to stop radioactive water from getting out into the Pacific Ocean. Then the Nuclear Regulatory Agency, the NRA in Japan, says, Nuh-uh, you're not going to do it. And then four days later, the NRA comes back and says, Well, you can do part of it. I would have liked to have been a fly on the wall to watch that arm twisting. That NRA also decided to reduce 70% of radiation monitoring posts in Fukushima. 2,500 monitors to be removed, most of them situated in public facilities, including schools. We'll have this week's featured interview in just a moment. But first, I leave for St. Louis in two days to cover this Saturday's symposium on the West Lake Landfill, Bridgeton Fire, Cold Water Creek radiation contamination mess. On Friday... I will be with Dr. Helen Caldicott, Bob Alvarez, and the Westlake Moms as we tour all of the North St. Louis nuclear hot, hot, hot spots. I want to thank those of you who have contributed to support this trip with a special shout-out to Lonnie Clark of the Age of Fission podcast for her invaluable assistance. But I am still in need of your help to cover all the trip's expenses Nuclear Hot Seat operates on donations from you, the listeners, and now would be a perfect time to show your support. Now, just give what you can. It all counts, and many listeners donate the equivalent of a cup of Starbucks a month. This demonstrates how much they believe in what we're doing and want to see it continue. So I invite you to join them. Right now, go to NuclearHotSeat.com and click on the big red Donate button. Your donations will go directly to covering the expenses of this trip while I cover the Westlake Landfill. Whatever you can do to help, you have my deepest gratitude. I am thrilled to bring you this week's featured interview with Professor and Dr. Timothy Mousseau. He is an evolutionary biologist and a faculty member of the Department of Biological Sciences at the University of South Carolina where he has been since 1991. Beginning in 1999, 
Professor Mousseau and his collaborators have explored the ecological, genetic, and evolutionary consequences of low-dose radiation in populations of plants, animals, and people inhabiting the Chernobyl region of Ukraine and Belarus. More recently, he initiated a second research program in Fukushima, Japan. As I said in my opening, I've been attempting to secure an interview with Dr. Mousseau for over four years and am delighted to have caught up with him on Super Bowl Sunday. Dr. Timothy Mousseau, welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat. Thanks for having me. Let's start out with giving people a sense of what your background and training has been. I'm a biologist. I guess technically uh, an evolutionary ecologist. I've been interested in the genetics of adaptation in insects and birds and plants for for many years now. And uh, I started off with fish, but, (laughs) you know, moved into insects and then later into birds. I started working on things, climate change sort of questions early on. What, you know, what are the genetics of how plants and animals adapt to changing environmental conditions? and just sort of slipped into different kinds of uh, science as time went by. What drew you, or how did you slip into the subject of the impact of low-level radiation and the work that you did as a result? You know, like so many things, it was completely by accident. In 1999, a former dean of mine had gotten a a gift from uh, an alumni of the university promoting exchange between Ukraine and and our university, East-West Exchange, as it were. And he sent over a a pile of faculty and and other folks to to check out Ukraine to see what might be possible in terms of research and and, and also business opportunities for folks in South Carolina. So I went over there, looked around, and got to see the site. When you say the site, you're not talking about tourist sites, you're talking about (laughs) Chernobyl. I'm talking about Chernobyl. It was a miserable first visit to the uh, the airlines had lost my luggage in Paris and nobody could find them and so I was there with one t-shirt and a shirt and one pair of pants and and it was, you know, September, it was freezing cold and uh one of, one of my colleagues loaned me an extra shirt so I didn't smell too bad. But anyway, we did the tour of the the exclusion zone and and got the full the full treatment and and it looked interesting but I you know at the time I didn't really see any opportunities it wasn't until the next year that I was doing a uh, sabbatical in Paris with uh, Anders Mahler another biologist and we decided that uh, you know this might be a great opportunity to look at fundamental evolutionary processes in the face of this extra mutagen in the environment. You know, people have studied how natural selection shapes organisms and populations and speciation, but they've never, nobody's ever really looked at how mutagenesis will inf- influence this adaptive process uh, over time. And, and so we, we saw it as a great opportunity to do some fundamental biology. And, and so we started going that year and uh, we haven't stopped going. So 2000 was the first year that we were working together on research projects in that Chernobyl exclusion zone area. Did you begin the work with any expectations or any goals, or did you just go to look around and see what you could find? Yeah, well, you know, certainly, you know, we are explorers, as it were, and, and, you know, discovery is really, you know, a large part of what science is. Scientists are driven to explore new questions just because of their interest in discovery. And certainly that was a big part of our interest. But we did have some sneaking suspicion, some hope that there might be some signs of adaptation to this kind of unique environment. We actually had some thoughts that uh, maybe the females, mothers in particular, might be doing some interesting things to their eggs to help the young survive in the face of this this ionizing radiation. One of the areas of specialty I'd had at the time was so-called maternal effects, things that moms do to enhance offspring fitness. It's a whole class of adaptations that that are really really important across the plant and animal world. And so we were we were really hoping to discover some some new kinds of adaptations related to how the organisms were were handling the radiation. And and we're still looking at at that side of the question, but. But uh, unfortunately, we really haven't found much evidence for adaptive response in, in an evolutionary sense. What were some of your early findings from Chernobyl? 
the first visit uh, in 2000, we went out and found all of the barns, uh, the old dairy farms that we could find in and out of the zone. We, we snuck inside the zone at the time. At the time, the exclusion zone wasn't really as high security as it is now. And, and so it was easy to sort of zip in and zip out with nobody ever catching you. And so we, we found a, a number of the old dairy farms that still had barn swallows in them inside the zone outside the zone as well as in areas a fair distance away that were much cleaner less radioactive and, and started catching all the birds we could catch and the first discovery was quite striking the uh, many of the birds living inside the exclusion zone or right on the border of the exclusion zone had patches of little white feathers on them you know nothing nothing really striking no three-headed monsters or anything like that but these birds were extremely unusual they were pale to begin with but they also had the these patches, what we've been calling partial albinos. There are other names for this phenomenon, but everybody sort of understands partial albinism when you say it. And this was much higher in the areas of high radiation. There are there are few birds in the cleaner areas that show this, but very, very few relative to the hot areas. So that was sort of the first observation. We came back each year to these same farms to follow these same birds. And the, the, the beauty of barn swallows is that they'll actually come back to the same barn the same nest as long as they're alive once they start breeding and so we put uh, little bands on their legs so we could actually track their survival from one year to the next we could see how many eggs they were laying and how well their babies were doing and uh, we could take a little blood from them so that we could look for genetic damage and and antioxidant levels and we, we figured out how to get a little sperm sample from the males so we could look at how how well their reproductive materials performed and all of this started to add up to an interesting story after a couple of years. First, we noticed that males in the more radioactive areas were showing sperm that was either deformed or not particularly active, uh, not particularly good at doing its job. That was the first sort of clue that fertility might be a, an issue for these birds. Then we started to notice that many of the birds had other strange abnormalities, physical abnormalities, tumors on their, their heads, tumors on their feet and on their rear ends and sometimes on their wings, just sort of abnormalities that you never see in a normal population. And so all of this kind of added up to the fact that these birds were not doing particularly well. They were living half as long as birds in clean areas, uh, they were having fewer offspring. The male, as I said, the male fertility was lower. Uh, recently, we've also shown that they have higher levels of cataracts in their eyes. Uh, it's just a plethora of negative consequences of, of the exposure to radiation. That was the beginning of all of this. And you go back to Chernobyl still every year to do the updates on the bird population? You know, we do. We've been tracking the barn swallows every year. And, uh, you know, every year we try to add a little experiment to the pot so that we learn a little bit more about what might be going on. The fact that we've been doing it for 15 years straight, this will be the 16th year for these populations, gives us a lot of statistical power for the sorts of questions uh, we're interested in. Some, some years we've been putting little dosimeters on the, uh, the legs of these, these birds for the last four years. And so now we have a really good idea of, of how big a dose they're getting as they fly around. And, and that's never been documented before. We keep following these birds. But in 2004, 2003, 2004, we realized that barn swallows were great, but people, you know, had broader interests than just barn swallows. Well, what we realized actually was that there was this uh, growing interest in what was going on in the Chernobyl zone. We weren't just doing it to satisfy our own curiosity at that point. We realized that other folks were interested in, in the questions that we were getting were said this is happening to the barn swallows is it happening to the other birds what's happening to the insects what's happening to the mammals and so we started to branch out into a few other areas we brought in other experts from other universities to, to collaborate with to help us in, in some of the systems we had less experience with and so now we've been working on the entire bird community i guess three four years ago we added a group from Finland who are mammal specialists, small mammal specialists, and we've been trapping rodents in Chernobyl as well as in Fukushima and uh, learning an awful lot about other components of the ecosystem in the area. Any results that you can report as yet? 
one of the great things about working with you know some of the best scientists, some of the most accomplished scientists from around the world on these projects is that you know we're getting a lot done. We've published about 80 papers in the last 10, 11 years on Chernobyl and Fukushima, and, and folks can go to my website and, and get them all. But the latest results, we published a paper last week, actually, it came out. It was one of our first papers on the small mammals, the rodents of Chernobyl, where we document an increase in the rate of cataracts in the eyes of the females. You know, we published a paper on the birds of Chernobyl two or three years ago, showing again that the cataracts in the eyes were much higher levels in, in, in the more radioactive areas. Now we're seeing this also in the rodents. And so this provides substantial support for the hypothesis that, you know, this is the radiation that's causing this. Folks tend to, uh, you know, if they can, they will throw out some objections to some of these ideas. They'll suggest that it's not due to the radiation, it's due to something else. And they'll have a long list. But clearly, the more results we have that run in parallel uh, among different systems in Chernobyl, but also amongst the same systems in both Chernobyl and Fukushima, when we find the same kinds of results in both places, the only explanation that makes any sense is that it's the result of the radiation exposure. And so, so that's why we've invested so much into replicating uh, most of our Chernobyl work in as much as we can in Fukushima as well over the last five years now. When Fukushima happened, how long did it take before you and the other researchers were on site and taking samples? <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, it was really a challenge. So as soon as the disaster happened, I realized that we just had to get there. We just had to get there to not only because the science needed it, but we knew there was going to be a lot of questions related to the impacts. And the two disasters had, you know, many similarities and many differences. And so it was really kind of important to get there as quickly as possible. The first thing I did was started calling around to the, the Japanese embassy, our state department, uh, our department of energy, and I couldn't get any answers from anybody about, you know, whether or not we'd be able to do any research over there, uh, whether it was going to be a problem to get into the zone. No one would answer any questions. And so by June of 2011, we decided that we couldn't wait any longer. We really need to get there. And so uh, I bought some tickets for Anders and I, Anders Muller, my, my partner in, in research. He flew to Tokyo from Paris and I flew from South Carolina. And we met there, rented a car and, and just decided to dive into it. And we just drove up to Fukushima from there. It was the first time I'd actually had to drive on the left-hand side of the road. It was a bit of a challenge. But, yeah. That's not the worst challenge you've been facing, Tim. No, no, but it was certainly interesting driving on these tiny little Japanese roads uh, on the wrong side of the road. But you just sort of follow the traffic and you do okay. But anyway, we got there and we started driving around the area and realized that, oh my God, they had not fenced off uh, most of the area. They'd fenced off the areas close to the reactor that had the highest levels of contamination, but there were vast parts of Namiya and Idate, most of Idate, all of Idate, where you know levels at that time, uh, in July of 2011, were above 100, 100 microsieverts per hour, which is, you know, as you know, is, is extremely contaminated. And people were whizzing around in their cars. And anyway, it was good for us because it meant that we could access these areas without, <laughs> without restrictions. And so we did manage to get quite a bit of work done in, in those two weeks. We did the first censuses of birds and, and insects that anybody had done, and they really haven't been uh, replicated to any extent except by us every year. Uh, we've been there every year since then uh, to repeat these surveys. And the basic findings are that uh, the birds were hit quite hard the first year, and they have declined ever since. And the impacts have actually been increasing as far as the birds are concerned with each passing year. When you say the impact, are you talking about the size of the population or mutations and changes that you have observed in existing populations? So most of the work that we're doing in Japan with respect to the birds is looking at overall population abundances and biodiversity. And it, this we take as kind of a cumulative measure of how well these birds are doing. And the approach we've taken is to survey large numbers of locations. We, we actually have 400 sites spread across Fukushima Prefecture 
three hundred of them are in very you know medium to very hot, very contaminated areas, and then about a hundred of them are in relatively low contamination areas, and so this gives us the ability to discern the impacts of radiation on population sizes and to look at how the populations are affected through time. The initial observation was that the birds and the and the butterflies were particularly impacted and that the birds in particular have shown increased declines, increasingly smaller population sizes through time. And so last year we actually published five publications uh, related to the abundance and diversity of, of the bird populations. The initial uh, observation was that the birds and the butterflies were particularly impacted even that first year. With the birds, we've now since documented over a five-year span that the negative impacts have been increasing on these birds and that it it really is a a very similar pattern in some ways to to what we've seen in, in Chernobyl over the years. We've published five papers directly related to the bird abundance and and diversity uh, in the last year or so uh, on this question and a couple more that were published earlier on. The birds and the butterflies, you know, again, this this coincidence kind of really, really sparked my imagination because birds and butterflies are the only two groups of animals whereby the female is what we call the heterogametic sex. So, you know, in humans, males are XY and females are XX. So males are heterogametic. They have gametes of two different types and whereas females uh, have two X chromosomes, so they're homogametic. In birds and butterflies, it's reversed. It's the female that's heterogametic. And the relevance is that what we know from genetic theory is that mutations that occur on the sex chromosomes can be expressed immediately without you know having to have a second copy of that mutation on the matching chromosome. And most genes, because we have two copies of most genes or more, if there's a problem with one copy because of the redundancy, because we have two copies, the other one will do the job and you don't even notice the mutation most of the time. But when it occurs on the sex chromosomes, it can be expressed right away and that can have an impact on, on fitness. And when it's a male that's being zapped with mutations, it often doesn't matter because most species are polygynous and females will make multiple. And so if there's a dud male out there, it doesn't show up in terms of population growth rates. But when the female is expressing these mutations, it directly affects egg production. And when egg production is affected, then population growth rates are also affected. And that can happen immediately. And so so I had this notion that perhaps birds and butterflies were showing this high sensitivity, at least as measured by population growth rates, because of that shared genetic system. And we've just since finished an experiment to test this idea by looking at the moths in the area. Turns out moths are all the you know one other group of animals that, that have that same kind of sex determining system. So that's the sort of question that really turns me on. <laughs> yeah. Clearly. Are there other species that you are currently studying in Fukushima besides the birds, butterflies and moths? Yeah, we're also looking at the rodents. We've been catching mice all over the place. We've caught several hundred of them now. Uh, We're in the process of examining their eyes for cataracts, their internal organs for tumors and other developmental abnormalities and color changes. We have some uh, preliminary data that suggests that uh, the rates of tumors, particularly on the liver and and perhaps the bladder, are, are much higher. This hasn't been published, so this is just a hint. Until it's published, it's not real, of course, but for the sake of entertainment value, it's worth sharing. Have you done any studies on fish or other forms of sea life? I would love to do work on fish. You know, my first love as a biologist was was really with fish. Uh, It's much harder to do work on fish. We're starting to do a little bit of surveillance with the fish in coming to the U.S., but that, again, is uh, really just a sideline. It requires much greater resource availability to be able to work with marine systems. And there just hasn't been that kind of investment for research at this point. But we're, we are looking at the microbial communities, the bacterial communities and fungal communities. We're looking at the trees, looking at tree growth rates. Again, replicating a number of the sorts of studies that we, we did in Chernobyl to look at ecosystem level effects, uh, not just population level things. What sort of results are you finding at Fukushima 
that suggest that the mutations and the changes will follow the same pathway that's been followed more than 30 years after Chernobyl? It's really too early to say for sure that they're identical. There are a lot of reasons why they should be different. But to begin with, the first observation we made from the very first year of our study was that so there are a number of species that are common to both Chernobyl and Fukushima in the bird community. I think, I think we had 14 or 15 species of birds that were the same, and they showed similar patterns of effect due to radiation. So that was sort of the first clue. Again, the fact that the birds show this strong dose-dependent decline in population sizes. We published a paper in December where we actually took the 7,000 birds that we've counted over the last few years, and in collaboration with a group in France at the IRSN, they actually calculated a dose to each and every individual bird. And this is what the health physicists like to see, of course. Uh, they, they like to see that radiation exposure in, in terms of a dose, because doses can be different than just the exposures. And so we did this in collaboration and, and basically found the same pattern of declines with dose that we've seen in, in Chernobyl. And so this, again, is very, that level of convergence is really striking and really speaks to a likely common mechanism underlying the two effects, namely ionizing radiation. So we're pretty confident that that level. We've also been looking at brain size, you know, in the rodents, and we're seeing evidence. It's not published yet, but it will be soon, I hope. You know, again, parallels in the two places with respect to rodent development. And we're just finishing the analysis of tree growth before and after the disaster. Again, in Chernobyl, we found very striking impacts on the pine trees of the area. We're looking at four species of trees in, in, in Fukushima. They've all been measured, but it's just time to analyze the data and, and actually write up the paper. In terms of the kind of radiation that is hitting in these two areas, are they the same or is there some difference in the radioactive isotopes? In Chernobyl, because there was a nuclear fire burning along with a regular fire, the graphite rods were burning, fission was undergoing at the time, it actually volatilized a very wide range of different isotopes uh, in addition to the usual characters, the, the radioactive noble gases. There was cesium released in both places, but the strontium was not volatilized in Fukushima. It wasn't hot enough during the meltdown to volatilize the strontium. At least that's the story <laughs> we're told. Whereas in Chernobyl, you know, enormous quantities of strontium are released across the environment. It's been well documented, well measured. Uh, strontium is everywhere. The strontium-90 has about the same half-life as cesium-137. It's 29 versus 30 years. And so it's around still in great quantities. It's hard to measure because it's a pure beta emitter, so a standard gamma dosimeter does not measure it very accurately, although a Geiger counter can pick it up if it's close to it. Of course, at Chernobyl, there was lots of plutonium. You know, the spent fuel was actually volatilized as well, in the unspent fuel, and released in this sort of cataclysmic event, this fire that was burning, sort of like a, a volcano spewing radioisotopes into the atmosphere, injecting it into the atmosphere, and so they were transported far and wide, uh, hundreds of miles and longer. Whereas in Fukushima, on the terrestrial side of the event, uh, really was limited to the noble gases, radioactive iodine early on, and the cesium, cesium-134 and cesium-137. And so now, uh, you know, four or five years later, that's what we see on the terrestrial side. We see the cesium uh, is still there, cesium-134 and cesium-137. There's very little evidence, as far as we can tell, for strontium. We see the occasional blip of some of the other isotopes that are common, uh, silver isotopes, for instance. But on the terrestrial side, again, on the land, that really it's really just that one isotope. And also the other issue is that the amount of land that was contaminated to a high level was considerably less than what happened in Chernobyl, where vast areas, uh, hundreds of thousands of square kilometers were contaminated. So it's a completely different event in terms of the terrestrial impacts. The marine side now, that's another issue. The inputs to the marine system were vast. 
extremely large, probably, again, on the order of the Chernobyl event, and certainly uh, a much wider array of isotopes have been put into the ocean, certainly lots and lots of strontium as well as cesium, and, and there's certainly indications of some plutonium and other isotopes making it into the marine system as well. So again, that's that's a completely different event, and that's ongoing, and we know almost nothing about it. So that's a you know that's that's the big problem right now. In your research on either site, what has been your biggest surprise? <laughs> There's been many. The biggest surprise and the biggest disappointment has been that there hasn't been fundamentally much, much greater interest on the part of granting agencies and regulatory agencies. And we sort of could understand why interest in the Chernobyl disaster was waning onto the 2000s as we were as we were getting involved in it. Everyone thought that this kind of disaster could never happen again, that Chernobyl was a unique event, unique to the former Soviet Union in many ways, unique to that particular reactor design. It could never happen in the modern world, in the Western world. And then Fukushima happens, and of course, Everybody realizes, oh my God, it can happen here. If it can happen in Japan, it can happen anywhere. And so we really kind of expected that there would be much broader interest in, in supporting a large multinational effort to, to conduct as much research as possible and to take advantage of this opportunity to learn so that we might know much better how to deal with these kinds of accidents, small and large, in the future. And, and so, yeah, big disappointment, big surprise that there hasn't been a much broader array of interest. Now, certainly there's been lots of public interest, lots of interest by the media, uh, just not any evidence of investment by government agencies or, or other folks that should be investing in this kind of activity. Given that you have such a tin ear turned to you by government agencies, where have you gotten your funding to be able to do this work? Like a lot of people, <laughs> you know, we've done anything and everything we can to support our hobbies. <laughs> and, you know, for, for scientists, of course, research is everything. It's our, it's our whole life, and so we invest whatever it takes to do what we think is important to do. And certainly that is no different than, than most other <laughs> vacations, I think. And so I was just very, very fortunate that my university was very supportive of what we were doing and has, has helped us out considerably over the last 15 years. We've had a number of grants from you know the National Science Foundation, from the National Geographic Foundation, from the National Institutes of Health, as well as uh, several small philanthropies that have promoted our research. But of course, as I like to say, the biggest funding source really has been personal prostitution. <laughs> <laughs> oh, please clarify, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically working working at other unrelated activities to support my research habit, and that has really been the primary source of our, our funding. What, if any, pushback have you gotten from the officials out there, be it government or organizations or the nuclear industry? Has there been any concerted attempt to contradict your work or put roadblocks up to it? I don't think there's been any well-orchestrated conspiracy by any group to put up roadblocks. There hasn't been much help from a number of these groups. I guess it's kind of a passive-aggressive thing. <laughs> the lack of support in its own way is is a roadblock, of course. Scientists are craftsmen, and, you know, like a plumber, if you don't pay the plumber, he's not going to come do the work, you know, and, and scientists are essentially craftsmen, and, and without funding resources, most scientists are not able to conduct research. So most of the roadblocks have been this kind of passive-aggressive kind of thing, but for the most part, the only really vocal criticisms we've had to face have been surprisingly from some of the the more extreme anti-nuclear groups that have gone a little bit hypercritical at times. That's been kind of a surprise as well. Has there been any outreach to the United Nations to do a more coordinated international job of monitoring the impact in these two areas? 
You know, again, depending on who you speak to, if you talk to the folks at the International Atomic Energy Agency, which, of course, is the agency at the UN in charge of uh, regulating or making recommendations concerning regulations and uh, promoting the peaceful use of <laughs> the atom. And, uh, leave it alone! That's the peaceful use of the <laughs> atom! Leave it in the ground and leave it alone! But be that as it may, please continue. Yeah, yeah. So there have been, I think they have invested in reviewing the literature as it is and uh, as such as they believe it to be and have advisors here and there to make recommendations on how best to clean up and reduce the potential health risks to the local population. But I don't, there hasn't, I don't think there's been any major investment in, in any kind of research initiative. The Japanese, I think, have started a kind of research initiative, again, through the government agencies that are there, but, but nothing that would be open or available to independent scientists at academic institutions. So there, it's been rather limited. I have to ask, with you having been at Chernobyl so many times and having been at Fukushima only months after the disaster happened, being up close and personal with two of the worst, most contaminated nuclear hotspots on the planet. What have you done and what do you do to protect your health? Yeah, you know, that, that question has become uh, increasingly <laughs> important. Most of the radiation that we experience comes in the form of gamma radiation. And as such, like x-rays, there's really no way to protect yourself from it other than to not be there. And so to get the work done, you, you have no choice but to subject yourself to some extra gamma radiation. We minimize our exposure to the other forms of radiation, the, the, the beta and, and alpha emitters, by trying not to eat the local food, trying not to drink water, trying to keep the dirt out from under our fingernails and uh, not breathe the dust. But, you know... Like journalists going to war zones, you know, they, there's, there's really no way to avoid the bullets when you're actually there. And, and so you just have to, again, minimize the potential risk as best you can. Try to be careful. But if you, you know, you want to do this research, if you think this needs to be done, then there's no other way to do it than to be there. And how is your health at this point? <laughs> is it holding? Are you holding together? <laughs> yeah, good question. Unfortunately, uh, you know, the ravages of time are my main <laughs> issue. None of us are getting any younger, unfortunately. And this brings me to the next point, which is that because there's been this lack of investment, the lack of resources, the other thing that you can't do without resources is train new students, bring new students and postdocs, young people. To get them involved, you've got to provide incentives. You've got to be able to cover their expenses. And we're not training the young people that we really need to train to, to continue this work into the future. Where is your work going now? What's next and what do you project for yourself and the researchers who, with whom you do work in the near and the far future? We think it's critically important that we continue to monitor these populations for probably several decades. We jumped into Chernobyl 15 years after the event and we missed so much of what happened during those first 15 years. That was another reason we felt compelled to get there as soon as we could, uh, again, to fill in some of those gaps that really weren't documented following the Chernobyl disaster. But it, it's very clear that this is a dynamic process. It's an ongoing process that takes uh, many years to reach any kind of equilibrium, if it does at all. You know, again, as evolutionary biologists, as population geneticists, we suspect that there will be some kind of equilibrium reached between uh, immigration of animals and plants from adjacent areas that are not contaminated and, and those that are experiencing this mutagenesis as a result of the radiation, uh, and that the dynamics will be different in, in different places depending on the size of the areas that are affected and other environmental factors. But back up 10 years ago, when we started doing work, in this area, nobody thought that there were any consequences for the populations living in Chernobyl. The, the dogma at the time was that, as published in the Chernobyl Forum reports of 2005-2006, the dogma was that the animals and plants were actually thriving in the zone because there was a fence around it, people weren't hunting them, 
and the radiation was low dose radiation, which probably didn't really matter because animals die before the effects of radiation would would hurt them. And what we've learned in the last 10 years is that is absolutely false, that the consequences of, of the radiation exposure, especially in the areas of high radiation, that's most evident in these areas of higher radiation, but it's happening all the way down to uh, very low dose rate areas. They're significant and they're having very large impacts on some of the populations. The other thing we learned that nobody really knew anything about was that there's tremendous variability among different species, even among individuals of the same species, and how they respond, how they're affected by this radiation. And again, we're starting, just starting now to get a much better idea of what that might be related to. We published a paper uh, earlier this week that documents a really interesting property of these radiation-affected systems. There's very clearly a trade-off between the use of antioxidants and its consequences for oxidative stress and impacts on the, the success or disease in these, these organisms. That this balance between antioxidants and oxidative stress is what's really driving much of the individual and population level responses that we're seeing. For those of us interested in supplementation, are you saying high levels of antioxidants show that there's an ability to resist the radiation? That's what it looks like when we review all of the literature related to these two factors antioxidants and oxidative stress, it does look like there is this trade-off between the two. And, and, and one prediction from that might be that, yes, antioxidant supplementation might be beneficial in terms of addressing the issues. And that's not new, really. You know, people have talked about that a lot over the years. And, uh, and it's not just radiation that causes oxidative stress. Even just exercise, you know, causes oxidative stress. So antioxidants are good for you. But it seems that antioxidants are particularly good for you when <laughs> you're suffering from ionizing radiation exposure. And so we're starting to get a handle on, on these kinds of underlying mechanisms associated with sensitivity. And, and so it's really critical that this kind of work continue into the future, that there be more experimental studies, uh, studies that, that run parallel in the lab and the field. Again, using the, the field observations to direct the sorts of experiments that are needed to be done in laboratory conditions, but using uh, what we see in, in nature to, to help us understand better what's actually going on. Uh, so there's that kind of thing that really needs to be done, and we're hoping to be able to move in that direction a little bit more. We're starting to do genomics, whole genome scans of, of various organisms, and this we're hoping will provide, again, fundamental clues as to how the, the genome is influenced and, and how that results in disease of various sorts under conditions of ionizing radiation. So all those kinds of things. You know, the downside is that most of those kinds of, <laughs> that kind of work is very expensive, so there has to be some support. If you had unlimited funding and could do <laughs> any study, I mean, let's put it out there, let's dream the big dream, you could do any studies you chose or direct others to do any studies you chose, where would you want the attention to be put? The relationships between, again, survival, disease expression, uh, the physiological mechanisms uh, underlying variation in, in the expression of these, these characters, and the genetic mechanisms associated with it. There's just a whole suite of, of genomic tools now that are available to help us better understand how individuals respond to these different kinds of changes and or influences. And that's where we would be putting the funding at this point. Again, combining field-based research, observational research to and experimental research to help direct the finer scaled studies that are needed to understand the underlying mechanisms uh, associated with the risks of ionizing radiation. I guess the big question behind all of this is supposition now. How would you say that the work you're doing extrapolates to human beings and human survival? <laughs> Uh, the big question. So, you know, clearly, clearly there's some relationship. Humans are just animals, too. Humans have the same fundamental genetic systems, the same fundamental physiological uh, systems that react in very similar ways to what most other animals, re how they react as well. And so 
what we're finding in the mice in particular, the studies we're doing on the rodents are particularly relevant for humans. We use mice and rats in medical research to a very large extent because of their similarities to, to humans. You know, in Fukushima, you know, there, there, there are opportunities to do really important or potentially important research because of the abundance there of the wild pigs. You know, there's wild boars and pig hybrids that are scattered throughout the area that could be, again, uh, studied for the benefit, direct benefit of, of humans in the region. They also have monkeys living in this area. They have these Japanese macaques that are scattered throughout the zone in, in, in fairly large numbers. And to my knowledge, there's really minimal effort to make use of these systems to to better understand the impacts in, in, a, in a way that would be directly related to consequences for humans. The main difference with the humans, though, is that they are uh, luckily uh, mostly evacuated from the areas of highest contamination. The downside is that even if uh, humans are affected to the extent, same extent that we see with the animals, and I suspect they are in one way or another, but because of the, the lifespan issues, the fact that humans live much longer, uh, it takes much longer for these consequences to be expressed, and, and by that time it'll be too late. And so the studies that we're doing on plants and animals and microbes potentially serve as a valuable warning bell of potential hazards to, to the humans in the area, we, we hope. What can the listeners of Nuclear Hot Seat do to help support this critical research that you are doing? The usual sort of things. Uh, if you think that this kind of research is important, even, even though it's in Japan and, and Chernobyl, but if you think it has relevance for your life here in the U.S., let your elected representatives know. And, you know, this is, of course, the way things move forward in this country. And of course, if you happen to have uh, an interest in directly sponsoring research, that's always a possibility, too. There are, there are mechanisms to provide personal funding for this kind of effort through the university foundations, for instance. It's tax-deductible, even. I can see a Kickstarter <laughs> campaign on the horizon. People keep suggesting this to me, and, and I've avoided it so far. But, yeah, I, you know, again, I think every little bit helps, and so I think we may consider that option in the future. Well, if you do, Nuclear Hot Seat stands ready to help you get the word out. <laughs> All right. I appreciate that. Dr. Timothy Mousseau, thank you so much for being so informative, for doing the work that you're doing, and for being my guest this week on Nuclear Hot Seat. Pleasure, Lady. Thanks for inviting me. Dr. Timothy Mousseau. We will have a link to his website and the article he mentioned up on our website, NuclearHotSeat.com under this episode, number 243. Activist shout-outs! A big get well soon to Christina Consolo, a.k.a. Red Chick. She's been facing some health problems lately, so we are sending you lots of love and light for your rapid and complete healing. Some spiritual activists have asked for participants this Monday February 22nd, in an International Meditation Day to lower radioactivity background levels on Earth. You don't need to meditate all day. 15 minutes, any time at all, will do. So what the heck? Meditation is always useful, and who knows? It couldn't hurt. 15 minutes of meditation this Monday, February 22nd. Now, here's Erica Gray. She posts every week on Facebook the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's unusual events and run-for-the-hills notices, and she also alerts us to the shenanigans within the government's nuclear bureaucracy. Hi, this is Erica Gray with this week's Activist Action. We need you to comment on the Department of Energy's proposal to bring 900,000 highly radioactive graphite balls from Germany to the United States. During the 1950s Adams for Peace program, the United States shipped uranium over to Germany to use it for their experiments with an agreement to accept the waste back from them. With an agreement between the Department of Energy and Germany, if they decide to proceed with the project, the German government would work with the Department of Energy to transport spent nuclear fuel and chartered ships across the Atlantic Ocean to Joint Base Charleston Weapon Station near Charleston, South Carolina. And then from there, the cask would be transported to Savannah Riverside on dedicated trains. 
We're talking about 455 castor casks. And by the way, the cask that this highly radioactive graphite balls are in has not been approved yet by the NRC. There's three action alternatives to take. The best one is number one, which is no action alternative, which means leave the waste in Germany. We already have enough of our own that we don't know what to do with. Public comments are due March the 11th, 2016, which is not a lot of time. We need you to go to regulations.gov and comment. It's called the Environmental Assessments, Availability, Etc., Acceptance and Disposition of Spent Nuclear Fuel. There'll be a link up on the Nuclear Hot Seats website. Thank you, Erica Gray. And we will also have a link up on the website to a video that explains in more detail what this German shipment of nuclear waste to the U.S. is all about. Up on the website, NuclearHotSeat.com, under this episode, number 243. Here's today's final thought. I am honored and humbled to be going to St. Louis to meet the brave activists, hear from some of our top genuine experts, and do what I can to continue to help get the word out about what the moms and their allies in North St. Louis are facing and what we need the government to do about it. That's where all my thoughts are going right now, and I'll have more for you next week with a Nuclear Hot Seat special on the North St. Louis Nuclear Nightmare. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, February 16, 2016. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from enenews.com, bigstory.ap.org, theadvocate.com, nola.com, wdtn.com, capecodtimes.com, cleanenergy.org, allgov.com, mlive.com, environmentalecho.com, santafenewmexican.com, environmental protection agency, theecologist.org, informable.com, examiner.com, and Byron Delir. Imaging-resource.com, scmp.com, asahi.com, our favorite fox, dunrenard.wordpress.com, fukushima-diary.com, and our friend Iori Mochizuki, cnn.com, japantimes.co.jp, theguardian.com, greenpeace.org, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the heavy-hearted haunted souls at World Nuclear News, and the Nuclear Hot Seat Facebook community, which you are all invited to visit and like and enjoy. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weber, accompaniment by John Barnard, recorded at Winslow Court Studio in Hollywood. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV on StuWebRadioNetwork.com, formerly Veterans Truth Network, in New Zealand by NewZSentinel.com, and ActivateMedia.org, an offshoot of the Occupy movement. We're always looking for other networks to connect with, so if you know of a news aggregator or community radio station or cable station or, gee, Richard Branson, anyone who would like to carry the show, do put us in touch. Check out the archive, everyone. You can do so by going to NuclearHotSeat.com, also checking iTunes under Podcast and on the YouTube channel under Nuclear Hot Seat Videos. And a reminder that your contributions help keep Nuclear Hot Seat going and growing and me going to St. Louis to cover the Westlake landfill disaster. So please, whatever you can do this week to help us out with a donation, do so at NuclearHotSeat.com. And guys, I really do appreciate it. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues. So if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at NuclearHotSeat.com. We are copyright 2016, Libby, Halevi, and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed, as long as proper attribution is provided. This is Libby Halevi of Hardestry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that we've all had our nuclear wake-up call. Now, don't go back to sleep, because we are all in the nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seat, what are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat, what have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot 
Let's see. The corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat. It's the bomb.